Thank you. <laughs> Welcome to worship on Palm Sunday. Welcome to those of us, or those who are joining us online. Um, I just wanted to start out with a few quick announcements before we move into our worship this morning. Um, take a look at your, the back of your bulletin. We have a number of things coming up, but I'll highlight a few. Um, I don't have like a fun song prepared. My kids are a little disappointed. I don't have like a more exciting announcement this week. But I do want to encourage you to sign up for Camp Casey. This is our summer uh, church camp out in July. Super fun. It's one of my family's favorite things to do. I'm an introvert and I still love going. So it's just really fun. It's a nice way to get to know people in a little more low-key um, environment. And there's plenty of time to do stuff together, plenty of time to just relax on your own. Um, if you are not a camper, we there are a few spots in houses available um, up at Camp Casey that you can stay in. And also, we encourage people just to come up for the day on Saturday um, and spend the day with us if you're not able to, to stay overnight. But if you want to sign up for a camping, uh, a campsite, or a house, a spot in a house, the deadline to do that is April 1st. That's a week from tomorrow. Laurel pointed out that is not a joke. It is not an April Fool's joke. It is the actual deadline. So if you would like to sign up today, you can talk to... Thank you. That was, that was great. Uh, you can talk to Paige right here. Look for her in the green shirt. Um, or you can sign up online. There was a uh, link in our, the Connect, our weekly email that went out um, where you can sign up online or you can just reach out to the church office, office at shorelinecovenant.org, and we can get you um, connected to that. So um, otherwise, I just want to kind of look ahead this week as we move into Holy Week. Um, it's Palm Sunday today. You can see we have um, palms and we have more coming. Uh, we also have a Good Friday service this, uh, this Friday at 7 p.m. here in uh, the sanctuary. I believe that service is not live streamed. Is that correct, Ben? Sorry to interrupt your uh, conversation with Judah. The Good Friday service is just in person, not online. Okay. But we have Easter worship next Sunday at our regular time, 10 a.m. here, or that will be live streamed. Um, I do want to invite you to come before the service as well for an Easter brunch. If you can bring uh, like a brunch item to share, that would be great. Um, but our youth, some of our youth attending our youth trips this summer will be setting up and cleaning up and making sure the table stays full of yummy food. Um, so we'll have a donation basket out. It's, it's a free brunch, but if you'd like to make a donation when you um, show up and, and are tantalized by all of the really good treats, um, all the proceeds raised will go to our, our summer youth trips, and we would love to support them in that way. Um, so that's coming up on... Sunday, so Friday, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, I think that's all. So I just want to um, close with a reminder, we have some new global partners that we are joining with to support in the work they're doing, the work that God is doing through them um, internationally, and they're going to be sharing a little bit more about what they do uh, later in the service, but if you'd like a chance to meet them and hear more in depth about the work that God has called them to do. You can stay for lunch after the service and they'll be sharing more. And that will probably begin about 10, 15 minutes after the worship service wraps up. So I encourage you to stay for that if you can. I think it'll be really interesting to hear about what they're doing. Um, at this time, I would like to invite any of the kids in preschoolers, elementary age kids, or what the heck, like youth too, if you want to, um, to join Laurel and Pastor Sally in the lobby. We need your help with a Palm Sunday celebration. And the rest of you adults, you'll get to join in that in a little bit. But for now, just take a moment to greet each other and say good morning and Hosanna.
Okay, I would like to invite you all to return, but not to your chairs, to stand up in your place. We are going to have a call to worship, so I invite you to stand with us. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Zechariah. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, riding and gent or gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and pl placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Oh, yeah. 
Amen, amen. You can have a seat. And are you guys? Well, good morning. Welcome again to Shoreline Covenant Church on this Palm Sunday. Uh, my name is Sally. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's great to see all of you here this morning. And so we have a little bit of a different thing happening this morning. We have some of our new global partners that are joining with us this morning, and I just want to give a little heads up to you folks online. Because of where they're serving and their, uh, their work that they're going to be doing, we can't uh, mention them online. And so for you guys who are watching online, this is maybe a time to yeah, we're going to pause the stream for a moment. Maybe you could get coffee or have a bathroom break and then come back ready f uh, for when we're at our sermon time and stuff. And so, I don't know if we're good to, are we good to go? Nope, I got to pause. Two seconds, no problem. Let's see, it's a little bit interesting. You guys get the real deal in person. Yes. It's very fun. See, they're going to get some like background music online and stuff so they can be worshipful and sit while we hear some new information here, which will be fun.
go to support our global partners and our local partners around here in our neighborhood and beyond. So as that place plate comes by, uh, you're welcome to give. If you're a guest or if this is your first time, please just pass it by. But, but we all know that God uh, has given us so much with such generosity. His love, um, he provides for us, and so we have an opportunity to give back and uh, for the work of his kingdom through our gifts. So um, let me pray for our offering, and then we will take a moment. God in heaven, uh, we thank you so much for today and for the opportunity to gather and worship you. Um, we bring all of who we are before you, all the good, the bad, um, the things that need work, we place it all in your hands. We know that you are a generous God that gives of your love uh, so freely and generously, and you also provide us with what we need when we ask. And so, Lord, I pray that as we bring forth all of our gifts, all of who we are, that you will multiply it for the use of your kingdom to further it for your glory and for our neighbor's good. Um, please fill us as we give. In your name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, new friends. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Sally. It is uh, wonderful to continue in worship together, and as as we turn to God's Word on this Palm Sunday, I want to invite any of our kids uh, who are kind of elementary aged, if you would like to head out to junior church, you can head out with Miss uh, Sari, and she will take you out to junior church if you're interested. As always, any of our young ones are welcome to stay in the service with us, and kind of you can hang out at the, uh, at the family-style tables in the back, or you can hang out uh, in your seat right where you are. Um, but you can also head out for some age-specific programming if you'd like. Well, I'm Pastor Bennett. It is great to be in the house of the Lord today. It is great to hear about um, old work and new work happening around the world that we can be a part of, that we can uh, send people on our behalf and support uh, God's kingdom expanding and unfolding and enfolding people in more places, in new places, in the same old places where God has been working forever. So we are, we should be, I think, overjoyed to join in new works that we have not been involved with before. So it is great to do that. Well, we heard the story of Palm Sunday read this morning, and we've kind of acted it out in a way through our children uh, bringing palms to us, and, and we have palms scattered down the aisle, and we, we celebrate this story. And, and we're going to be, uh, we heard read earlier, um, I believe it was from Matthew's gospel that it was read for us uh, earlier, and we're going to be in Luke's gospel, in Luke's account of the story of Palm Sunday. But first, I wanted to, you know, it, it feels like an opportune moment going into Holy Week to bring us up to speed with the whole ministry of Jesus right now. And so I'm not going to preach through the whole gospel, but I want to take us on a visual tour through the life and, and ministry of Jesus. So go with me, if you will. The life of Jesus, birth to adulthood. Now, we're just going to fly through this really quickly, but you can see Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem. Jesus is born. They have to flee to Egypt. They return to Nazareth after the death of Herod. And so then the life of Jesus, his ministry begins. Now, we skipped a, a couple of decades in there, but his ministry begins. And what you'll kind of see is this kind of cyclical nature to the path of Jesus and his ministry. He, he kind of heads down to Bethany beyond the Jordan where he's baptized, and then he kind of makes his way through Jericho into the wilderness, and then he goes up through Jerusalem, and he's back home, and then we continue on. Um, in the third phase, his early ministry, he kind of spends a lot of time journeying from Jerusalem back up toward the Sea of Galilee, toward Nazareth, and, uh, and he does a whole lot of ministry. Again, I told you a quick flyover, and then he kind of spends some time in Galilee, uh, where he's from, and, and doing ministry around the Sea of Galilee, and we'll, we see a lot of different miracles and different things that he does teaching and preaching and, and healings, and, and, and so he does some amazing things. And then from there, he kind of uh, goes into his season of Gentile ministry, where he kind of heads up toward what, what is now Lebanon, and he does ministry there, and he journeys around. He journeys around through the Decapolis, which is this place of 10 cities, which was not a Jewish area, and so he's doing ministry there. And, and then he heads kind of back up, and then he begins his journey south. So he's way up north, and then he begins his journey, and we'll always see see in the Gospels, there's this turning point, this kind of paradigm shift in the life of Jesus where it says, it gives us this idea, and then he turned toward Jerusalem. And, and that's kind of what leads us up to today. He turns toward Jer Jerusalem, and, and, and up till this point in like all of the Gospels, he's been saying, my time has not come yet. My time has not come. He's telling people he heals, keep it quiet. Don't go spreading it around. And, but even though he does that, it, it can't help but spread. And so Jesus is coming to this point where he now is turned toward Jerusalem. It is now time for him to go toward Jerusalem, towards what he knows is coming. And so he doesn't stray away from it. He doesn't hide from it. He journeys toward Jerusalem. And that's what brings us up to our story today in Luke 19. And so in Luke 19, in 
excuse me. His, uh, in, in Luke 19, we're going to see the life of Jesus here kind of come to this climax, and all of our scripture will be on the screen if you want to follow along there, or if you have your own version, you can follow along in that. But Jesus comes to Jerusalem, verse 20, 28 and following. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you. As you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If someone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. So now we've been in maps, so I want to show you the map of where they are now, zoomed in kind of on the area of Jerusalem. So he's coming from Bethany, and this is the road that leads from Jericho. He's coming from Jericho kind of in this phase, and he's going through Bethany to Bethphage, and that's the Mount of Olives there. And so this is where it happens, and it's about one mile outside of the walls of Jerusalem. And so he's there um, on the mount, around the Mount of Olives, and he tells two of his disciples, go ahead of us into town, likely Bethphage is the town that he's sending them into, and you will find, uh, you will find a colt there, a young donkey, and, and untie it and bring it to me. And in case anybody asks you about it, just tell them the Lord needs it. This is an odd request, is it not? I mean, Jesus sends two of his disciples to find a donkey that had never been ridden, a young donkey. This is very strange. But give its owner assurance when you show up. Just, just tell them the Lord needs it. They'll be fine. They'll be fine. Have you ever had a neighbor show up at your house, like just walk in to get the keys to your car? It's fine. The Lord needs it. Yeah, that, that wouldn't go too well, huh? The Lord needs it. It's this very odd request, and, and, but what I think here, there's this deep spiritual truth that exists in this moment, and that's this. Sometimes what God asks you to do feels ridiculous. Sometimes what God asks you to do feels ridiculous. And, and it's not just Jesus in this moment. I mean, God has a strong track record of asking people to do things that feel ridiculous. Noah, hey, build this giant boat, not near the water, and fill it with a zoo full of animals because I'm going to send a flood. Hey, Abraham, I promised you that I would make your descendants so numerous. They would be like the sand in the desert, and now I finally gave you a son. And you know what I want you to do? I want you to take him up on a mountain and kill him. Moses, you, 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 you were, were a Hebrew baby. You were saved and you were raised in the palace like Egyptian royalty. And, and then you killed somebody and you had to flee. And now it's been like, you're like 80 and you're old and you've been living out here and far from the center of the action. You've been tending your, your, your herd on the side of the mountain. And, and, and he shows up in a burning bush and says, I'm going to use you to deliver my people from Egypt. And Moses is like, but, but, but I have a stutter. I can't, I can't speak on, on your behalf, God. Send somebody else. But he sends Moses. And then there's Jesus, who when there's a, a man who was born blind, who, who's been blind his whole life, and, and Jesus shows up and he says, well, I'm going to spit in this dirt and make a salve and put it on your eyes, and then you're going to go wash in this pool and that'll heal you. Do it. Or how about we feed 5,000 people with a few loaves and some fish? God is kind of in the business of making what seem like ridiculous requests of us. Sometimes what God asks you to do is going to feel ridiculous. God has a long history of doing that. And this one was just as ridiculous. But it was also the fulfillment of a prophecy from some 500 years earlier in Zechariah 9.9 that was also kind of, would have felt a little bit ridiculous at that time. And Zechariah said this, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, 
on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Wait, somewhere in there the story feels like it takes a hard right turn from victorious and righteous and your king is on a donkey. And yet this is what Jesus is fulfilling. And Jesus asks a couple of his disciples to play this ridiculous yet important role. And sometimes Jesus also invites us to play important roles in his mission. And sometimes what feels ridiculous and what is important are one and the same. Sometimes what feels ridiculous and impossible is one and the same with what is important and missional and powerful. You see, a donkey was a symbol of humility and peace. And just in case they didn't get the symbolism there, he gets a baby donkey. (laughs) A young donkey, a child donkey, in case you weren't picking up on the fact that I want humility and I want peace, I'm going to bring a child, a, a childlike peace. Where have we heard this from Jesus before? Unless you become like one of these little ones, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God belongs to ones like these, just in case they didn't pick up on the image of peace and gentleness and humility. Here's a child, a childlike version of it. Continuing on in verse 32, those who were sent ahead, the two disciples went and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? And they replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. Can you imagine being the owner of that colt? But can you imagine being those disciples? Like, it actually worked. (laughs) We told him the Lord needs it, and he let us have it. How crazy is that? And here's the thing, when, when we find ourselves in this place where Jesus is asking us to do kind of ridiculous things or impossible things, and then we're faithful enough to go do it, what happens? We will find it just as he told us we would. They go and follow this kind of ridiculous request of Jesus, carry out this weird mission, and it actually works, and they find things just as Jesus told them it would be. Have you ever had an experience like that? Where you kind of felt like, I know this is what faithfulness to Jesus looks like right now. I know what it looks like to follow God in this moment, but in the world, it kind of looks ridiculous. In my workplace, it kind of looks ridiculous. In my neighborhood or even maybe in my family, it's a little bit ridiculous. Love your enemy and pray for those who hate you. That's ridiculous, God. Pursue peace and hold on to it when you find it? That's a ridiculous request. Have you lived in 2024, Jesus? And yet, when we, when we hear the call and the pointing and the direction of God speaking to us, and we are faithful to walk in that direction, we will find things just as Jesus told us we would. We will find things just like Jesus said they would, not like we expected them, not like we anticipated them, not like we would have drawn up the playbook, but just as Jesus told us we would find it. When we're obedient, we will find things just as he said they would be. Continuing on in verse 37. When they came near the place where the road goes down from the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. The Messiah has come to Judah. 
The king has come to Jerusalem. They are overjoyed. He will set the captives free. And so we celebrate and so we sing and we, we throw cloaks on the ground that he can ride on and we, we cut down branches from the trees and we wave them in this beautiful, strange, ridiculous, amazing, powerful parade. But what kind of king would he be? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, but what will he do? What is his vision? Who will he be? Humble and peaceful, as symbolized by the donkey. But let's see what else Zechariah said in that prophecy 500 years before that. If we continue on to verse 10, it says, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth by fulfilling this prophecy by Jesus saying, this is how I'm going to be the Messiah. Bring me a donkey. In fact, bring me a young child donkey. This is what I'm going to do. I'm choosing Zechariah 9 as the way that I will live, as the Messiah that I will be. And so by fulfilling this, With his arrival from verse 9, Jesus is also claiming these promises from verse 10 and how he will rule. I will take away their instruments of war, not just from Israel's enemies, but also from Israel. And I will proclaim peace to the nations. He's not just a savior and a king for Israel. He is peace for all nations, for all people. His rule will extend from sea to sea and to the ends of the earth. And the noise of his praise will not be silenced, even if you silence the people. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. They should not be saying these things about you. They should not be calling you king. They should not be calling you the the, the son of God. They should not be calling you the Messiah. They should not be doing this. Quiet them down. Rebuke them. Tell them that they are wrong. Please. Now there's so much that would have gone into this. You see, they're worried as they're coming close to Jerusalem, this, this place where there, there are, is Roman battalions and Roman leadership where, where they're afraid that if Israel has a political leader that Rome will come and squash the people and destroy the people and tear down the temple for good. So they're afraid of what will happen if Jesus is being proclaimed and yet here's this parade where people are shouting that he's the king, where they're shouting that he is the Messiah and so they're worried. They're worried about what Rome will do to them. But they're also silencing him because they don't believe in him. They don't believe he's worthy of this praise. They don't believe he is who the crowds are saying he is. And yet Jesus says that his praise cannot be silenced. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. The stones will cry out. As Jesus neared the city of his death, He knew that true praise of God, praise that included God's people, truly pursuing the kingdom was not happening. That people were not truly pursuing God's kingdom as it was intended. That they were pursuing their own kingdoms and their own safety and their own security and their own perpetuation instead of the kingdom of God. And he says, I could stop these people, but even the very stones would cry out because it's the truth. It's the truth that exists not just in the mouths of people, not just in the, in the ears of you hearing it. It's a truth that exists in the very created nature around us, in the stones, and even the stones that are from beginning to end will cry out, and they will shout, and they will give praise where praise is due because this praise is not an ending praise. It is a never-ending praise. 
And so even the rocks will cry out. The stones will bear witness to the Messiah. And yet Jesus knows that these words will not be enough. He knows that these shouts will change and turn and turn upon him. He knows that God's people did not have the eyes to recognize God's salvation when it was living and breathing and among them. He knew that they would miss it. God's people did not recognize God in their midst and they would, they would soon prove just how mistaken they were. And so as they approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. He wept over the city, the city that would call for his trial and torture and death. Jesus wept over that city. He wept over that city, though, not because of his suffering that was to come. And that suffering would be great. But he wept over the city because the city was so lost and hurting and blind to the kingdom of God in their midst. He wept because they missed it. He wept because what was coming was necessary. And so Jesus wept because the city was lost and hurting and blind. And so he wept. Friends, sometimes the requests of Jesus seem ridiculous. But we can trust that when we follow God's leading, we will find things just as he says they will be. We can trust that. We can trust a Savior who is faithful and truthful. We can trust a Savior who used his platform and his followership to promote humility and gentleness and peace. We can trust a Savior who willingly traveled to the city of his death for you and for me and for us. We can trust in God and we can trust in Jesus. So what do we do? When Jesus wept, if we were reading the verses after that, we see that Jesus wept because their lives were not pursuing his kingdom. So, so what do we do? We live lives that pursue the kingdom. We live lives that look to Jesus as a Messiah, a Messiah that came not in pomp and circumstance and power, not riding on a chariot or a war horse or a limousine. We pursue the kingdom of the Messiah who came on a child donkey to promote humility and gentleness and humbleness. We live lives that pursue those same things because in the very climax of the story of Jesus, he reveals to us that he is about humility. He is about peace. He is about gentleness. And so we pursue those things. And we praise and we praise and we praise so that those rocks never have to cry out. But we don't just praise with our words and with our songs and in this place. We praise with our lives when we walk out the doors and when we walk around town and when we go to our workplaces and our schools and when we go to our neighborhoods we give praise to God wherever we are in all that we do. We live lives of praise and lives of worship because we can trust in God that when God sends us out into the world with this ridiculous task of loving our neighbors as ourselves and even loving our enemies, that when we do that, we will find things just as he tells us 
they will be. And so friends, let us trust in God. Let us worship him daily, every moment and every hour. Because sometimes when Jesus makes quirky and ridiculous requests of us, that puts us right at the heart of the mission of God. Let's pray. God, we praise you and thank you for who you are. We thank you that you do call us and invite us into this work of your kingdom. We thank you that we get to hear your requests that seem impossible and ridiculous and quirky and that we get to say yes to them. We get to step with two feet into your mission, into the stream of your kingdom that is flowing. So Lord God, give us the eyes to see that stream. Give us the the ears to hear you speaking and guiding us and leading us that we can see your kingdom here on earth and join it and participate in it and expand the flowing of the river of your kingdom that flows to the throne room. Lord God, we know that you are good and you love us and that you are faithful and that you are faithful through your son Jesus who cares so deeply, who loves us so much that he endured what we, what we look at and retell and celebrate and, and grieve over this week. Lord God, may we spend time in the grieving this week. May we spend time in the celebration this week. May we experience all of the emotion that you experienced in that week 2,000 years ago that we still remember, that we still retell, and that still shapes us today. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. I invite you to stand with us. Um, We're going to sing a song. We'll praise in the valley
was dancing at the back. Mom's like, go up front. I'm like, okay. No. <laughs> amen, amen. Um, excellent service today. Uh, we are encouraged. We heard about things that God is doing around the world. We got to hear about Jesus entering the city triumphantly as a different kind of a king, a humble king. One From the time he was born, he was um, upending every expectation. And again, this week, he's going to continue to upend every expectation of what a king looks like for the people of Israel. So just a reminder, after service, we're going to have a lunch with our new global partners. If you didn't bring a lunch, we have some extra stuff for you. So please, please, please stay. Um, it'll be a great time to hear more about what God is doing. Sorry, I'm out of breath because I was dancing at the back. Uh, <laughs> of what God was doing or is doing here and around the world. So please, please stay. And so reminder, good Friday service this Friday at 7, Easter Sunday at 10 a.m., brunch before, come ready to eat and praise the Lord. So I leave you with this charge. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to what is good. Do not return evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Guard the dignity of all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Go in peace. Oh, pray.